In the French Quarter, there are several queer bars so full every night the fags spill out onto the sidewalk. A room full of fags gives me the horrors. They jerk around like puppets on invisible strings, galvanized into hideous activity. That is the negation of everything living and spontaneous. But I backslide now and then. One night, I got lobotomized drunk in Frank's and went to a queer bar. I must have had more drinks in the queer joint because there was a lapse of time. It was getting light outside when the bar hit one of those sudden pockets of quiet. The noise cleared like smoke, and I saw a red-haired kid was looking straight at me and standing about three feet away. He didn't come on faggish, so I said, how are you making it, or something like that. He said, do you want to go to bed with me? I said, okay, let's go. We got to a hotel, and he put down some routine why he should go in first alone. I pulled some bills out of my pocket. He looked at them and said, Better give me the ten. I gave it to him. He went in the hotel and came right out. No rooms there, he said. We'll try the Savoy. The Savoy was right across the street. Wait here, he said. I waited about an hour, and by then it occurred to me what was wrong with the first hotel. It had no back or side door he could walk out of. I went back to my apartment and got my gun. I waited around the Savoy and looked for the kid through the French Quarter. About noon, I got hungry and ate a plate of oysters with a glass of beer and suddenly felt so tired that when I walked out of the restaurant, my legs were folding under me as if someone were clipping me behind the knees. I took a cab home and fell across the bed without taking off my shoes. I woke up around six in the evening and went to Frank's. After three quick beers, I felt better. There was a man standing by the jukebox, and I caught his eye several times. He looked at me with a special recognition, like one queer looks at another. He looked like one of those terracotta heads that you plant grass in. A peasant face with peasant intuition, stupidity, shrewdness, and malice. The jukebox wasn't working. I walked the door and asked him what was wrong with it. He said he didn't know. I asked him to have a drink and he ordered Coke. He told me his name was Pat. Do you want a score, he asked. I'm due to score in a few minutes. I've been trying to hustle the dough. If you buy me a cap, I can score for you. I said, Okay. We walked around the corner past the NMU hall. Wait here a minute, he said, disappearing into a bar. I half expected to get beat for my four dollars, but he was back in a few minutes. Okay, he said, I got it. I asked him to come back to my apartment to take a shot. We went back to my room, and I got out my outfit. It hadn't been used in five months. If you don't have a habit, you better go slow with this stuff, he cautioned me. It's pretty strong. I measured out about two-thirds of a cap. Half is plenty, he said. I tell you, it's strong. This will be all right, I said. But as soon as I took the needle out of the vein, I knew it wasn't all right. I felt a soft blow in the heart. Pat's face began to get black around the edges, the blackness spreading to cover his face. 
I could feel my eyes roll back in their sockets. I came to several hours later. Pat was gone. I was lying on the bed with my collar loosened. I stood up and fell to my knees. I was dizzy and my head ached. Ten dollars were missing from my watch pocket. I guess he figured I wasn't going to need it anymore. Several days later, I met Pat in the same bar. Holy Jesus, he said. I thought you was dying. I loosened your collar and rubbed ice on your neck. You turned all blue. So I says, holy Jesus, the man is dying. I'm getting out of here, me. A week later, I was hooked. I asked Pat about the possibilities of pushing in New Orleans. Hmm. The town is in up with pigeons, he said. It's really tough. So I drifted along, scoring through Pat. I stopped drinking, stopped going out at night, and fell into a routine schedule. A cap of junk three times a day and the time in between to be filled somehow. Mostly, I spent my time painting and working around the house. Manual work makes the time pass fast. Pat and I began pushing in a small way, just enough to keep up our habits. We only took care of people Pat knew well and was sure of. About this time, an anti-narcotics drive hit the town, the chief of police said. This drive is going to continue as long as there is a single violator left in this city. The state legislators drew up a law making it a crime to be a drug addict. They did not specify where or when or what they meant by drug addict. One day I was broke and I wrapped up a pistol to take it in town and pawn it. When I got to Pat's room, there were two people there. One was Red McKinney, a shriveled-up, crippled junkie. The other was a young merchant seaman named Cole. Cole did not have a habit at this time, and he wanted to connect for some weed. As it happened, I had several ounces of weed in my house. Cole agreed to buy four caps in exchange for two ounces of weed. We began looking for old Sam above Lee Circle. Old Sam was the man these days. It was after doing 12 years in Angola. He was not in the old frame rooming house where he lived. We drove around slowly. Every now and then, Pat would see someone he knew and stop the car. No one had seen old Sam. Those guys wouldn't tell you nothing, Pat said. It hurts him to do anybody a favor. We parked the car near old Sam's rooming house, and McKinney walked down to the corner to buy a package of cigarettes. He came back limping fast and got in the car. The law, he said, let's get out of here. We started away from the curb, and a prowl car passed us. I saw the cop at the wheel turn around and do a double take when he saw Pat. They made us, Pat, I said. Get going. Pat didn't need to be told. He gunned the car and turned the corner heading for Carondelet. I turned to Cole, who was in the back seat. Throw out that weed, I ordered. Oh, wait a minute, Cole replied. We may lose him. Are you crazy, I said. Pat McKinney and I yelled in chorus, Throw it out! We were on Carondelet, headed downtown. Cole threw the weed out, and it skidded under a parked car. Pat took the first right turn into a one-way street. The Powell car was coming down the same street from the other end, going the wrong way. An old cop trick. We were boxed in. And I heard Cole yell, Oh, Lord, I've got another stick on me. The cops jumped 
start with their hands on their guns, but they did not draw them. They ran up to my car. One of them, the driver who had spotted Pat, had a big smile on his face. Where'd you get the car, Pat? Yes. The other cop opened the back door. Everybody out, he said. McKinney and Cole were in the back seat. They got out and the cops went through them. Right away, the cop who spotted Pat found the stick of weed in Cole's shirt pocket. I've got enough here to hold a whole bunch of them, he said. The cop had a smooth red face and he kept smiling all the time. The wagon arrived and we all got in. We were taken to the second precinct. The cops looked at my car papers. They couldn't believe that the car was mine. I was searched at least six times by different people. Eventually, we were all locked in a cell about six by eight feet. Pat smiled and rubbed his hands together. There's going to be some sick fucking dope fiends in here, he said. A little later, the turnkey came and called my name. I was taken to a small room that opened off the reception room of the precinct. In the room were two detectives sitting at a table. One was tall and fat with a deep south frog face. The other was a middle-aged, stocky Irish cop. He was missing some front teeth, which gave his face a suggestion of hair lips. This type cop could just as well be an old-time rod-riding thug. There was nothing of the bureaucrat about him. The cop in charge was studying the papers of my car. Everything they had taken out of my pockets was spread on the table in front of him. A glasses case, identification papers, wallet, keys, a letter from a friend in New York. Everything but my pocket knife, which the smooth-faced cop in the patrol car had put in his pocket. Suddenly I remembered about that letter. The friend in New York who'd written it was a tea head, and he pushed weed from time to time. He'd written to me, asking the price of good weed in New Orleans. I asked Pat, who quoted me a tentative price of $40 per pound. In the letter on the table, my friend made reference to the $40 rate and said he wanted some at that figure. The frog-faced cop folded the car papers carefully and put them aside. He picked up the envelope and looked at the address and the postmark. Then he took the letter out. He read the letter to himself. Then he read aloud, skipping where there was no reference to weed. He put the letter down and looked at me. Not only do you use weed, he said, you peddle it too. And you've got a batch of this weed stash somewhere. He looked at the letter, about 40 pounds. He looked at me. You better straighten yourself out. I didn't say anything. The old Irish cop said, He's like all these guys. He ain't talking. Till they get their fucking ribs kicked in. Then they'll talk and be glad to talk. We're going out and search your house, the frog-faced cop said. If we find anything, your wife will be put in jail too. I don't know what will happen to your children. They'll have to go to some home. Why don't you make the man a proposition, the old Irish cop said. I knew that if they searched the house, they would find the stuff. Call in the Federals and I'll show you where the stuff is, I said. But I want your word that the case will be tried in Federal and that my wife will not be molested. We went out and got in the car. The old cop was driving, and the captain was sitting in back with me. This is it here, said the captain. The old cop stopped the car and honked. A man with a pipe came out of the house and got in the back seat. He looked at me and then looked away, puffing on his pipe. 
The man looked young in the dark, but when he passed under a street light, I saw that his face was wrinkled, and he had black circles under the eyes. It was a clean-cut American boy face, a face that had aged but could not mature. I assumed that he was a federal agent. After smoking in silence for several blocks, the agent turned to me and took out his pipe. Who are you scoring off now, he asked. It's hard to find a score now, I said. Most of them have gone away. He asked what record I had, and I told him about the script case in New York. How much time did he do on that, he asked. None. It's a misdemeanor in New York. Public health law. Public health law number 334, as I remember. He's pretty well versed, said the old cop. When we got to the house, the captain grabbed me by the back of the belt. Who's in there beside your wife? I said, nobody. We came to the door, and the guy with the pipe showed my wife his hunk of tin and opened the door. I showed them the pound of weed I had in the house and a few caps of junk. This didn't satisfy the captain. He wanted 40 pounds of weed. You're not coming up with all of it, Bill, he kept saying. Come on now, we've shown you every courtesy. I told him there wasn't any more. The man with the pipe looked at me. We want it all, he said. I said... You've got it all. Finally, they collected the weed, the caps, and the thirty-eight revolver I kept in the house and got ready to leave. He belongs to Uncle now, said the captain to my wife as they left the house.